I'm Kiran Beer City and I have a design background but um, currently I run a school called the Riverside School in Ahmedabad and yeah, I'm a mother <laughs> with two great kids. When did you start the school and what was your idea, your basic idea? Um, I started the school in 2001, June of 2001. The basic idea was that of a mother being completely distressed by what was happening in the education system. So my story is really a story of a mother. It's not a story of an educationist or somebody who wanted to come out and change the world. None of that. It was just a complete, uh, um, I think, dismay about what my son was going through in his uh, in the school, and I realized that I that if he had to go through 15 years of his life with somebody telling him he's not good enough, that was not good enough for me. So I decided that I could do a better job, and that's really what uh, my journey was. So it really was that compelling and stirring to say, I can't have this. I can't have my son go through life like that. So how did you start Riverside? I mean, we are here in the house where everything started. Maybe you can... Yeah, actually, Riverside uh, was the second step. When I got into this uh, need to start a school, I didn't have the funds. I mean, I didn't have the kind of money to say, okay, I'll start the school. And I didn't... Uh, um, I didn't know how it would, it would happen. Luckily, I think it just so happened that uh, another school started that particular year when I took my son out of the school that he was in. And it, it had the kind of sen uh, sensibilities that I wanted. It was run by wonderful young uh, minds, you know, and people who wanted to do good in education. So I just thought, the people are good. You know, obviously, the school must be good. So it was a new school that was starting, and I put my son into that school. And I remember I went there and started teaching um, creative thinking. I said, that's such an mm. important idea. And apparently the feedback of my sessions was good enough for them to say, why don't you come on as a principal? So, this is, uh, so I said, okay, uh, I will join us as a principal. So we, we were this young, uh, idealistic group of people who said, you know, we would, we would change the world and we would, you know, uh, kind of do wonderful things. And I think um, in hindsight, it's a great start. Intention is great. But the action that needs to come cannot just be intuitive. That's a great start, but it can't always be that it's good uh, thought, but the action, I think somewhere we were falling short of one, uh, knowing what to do. I mean, we had a great uh, 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 a belief, we had a great uh, desire, but somewhere I think we, we didn't know what it needed. Uh, but I think for that first year, we were doing just phenomenal um, work. Anyway, we had a fallout with the owner of the school, and all of us kind of left. And uh, I went back to my design practice. I started designing again. And then one day, I, I remember coming back from one of the client meetings, and I said, I can't do this. I have to do something more meaningful. Uh, so I had the bill. It was lying empty. and. Uh, I had a friend of mine who uh, I called up, I remember, in December of 2000, I said, do you want to, yeah, let's start the school. She said, okay, let's, let's do it. So it literally just became that. And uh, in 2001, we put the ad in the papers to say we're starting a school. And subsequently, that's how it happened. But before you put the ad in, into the paper, did you set up a structure? Like no, nothing. I think what was clear right from the beginning and I think that's what design thinking allows us to do, allowed me to do very much, is that I didn't take anything for granted. Nothing. There was no, I have to do this. Um, so I think that was probably the most important structure. The structure was, does it make sense? Is it human-centered? Does it change the experience for the learner? Is it more meaningful? For me, those were the questions. It was not, what should I teach? It was, how does a learning experience become more, more meaningful? And that automatically meant the choices we were making for whether it was the curriculum, whether it was the timetabling, whether it was uh, the, the structure of how they, they sat or they moved, just changed. 
because the question always went back to the child. So the lens by which we were looking at behaviors or practices or processes was always uh, yes, sir, child, okay. the child. Uh, and childhood. I think these were the two words that governed um, mm -hmm. the years. So that was wonderful. And, and I think because of that, uh, everything that started emerging from the way we started looking at uh, the time the child would spend with us just became a lot more meaningful. Over the last 10 years, uh, it's changed dramatically. I mean, but what has never changed is that the lens will always be that child mm. in childhood. How would you describe this concept of design thinking you were just talking about right now at Riverside School? How is it translated into oh, daily action? Everything. I would say right from the hardware, I mean, I'm talking about the structure, the, the design of the school, as you, as you can see. The learning spaces are designed to ensure that uh, the child has, a, uh, has space for quiet time, uh, co community time, um, sort of, uh, it's transparent in terms of its, um, its, its, its movement. Uh, if you sit at, in the courtyard, all you can see is everybody. There's this learning environment that you're part of, and I think that, that's an important also. Aesthetics. Uh, design is a lot about aesthetics also. And unbeknownst to the children, they're part of a very aesthetic environment. There's this lovely yin and yang about the space, you know, the built and the non-built. Uh, there's this nature and, and the structure. And somewhere, it permeates into their psyche. So if you look at it, we have, we have no issues of defacing of property or, 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 or abuse of the furniture. None, none, none of that, because that doesn't even become part of their, their story. And that's, an, that's a hugely design. Uh, it's, and it's by design, not by chance, that this has happened. And I think a lot of the things that I say about design thinking is this whole concept of how do you imagine uh, an experience that is better because of what you have uh, observed in terms of the human pattern. So I'll tell you um, a small thing about uh, just the, one of the key constructs of learning is that you cannot have high quality learning for students if you do not have high quality learning for adults. It's a given, right? It's, it's, a, it's a common sense idea. But in most practice, it doesn't become common sense. Because most managements or most schools run, lead their school out of fear. Oh my God, I can't ask a teacher to stay back. Oh my God, what if they leave? Oh my God, you know, this whole thing of oh my God. And it's as if they're held hostage by the demands or the, the, the stories of the, of the teaching staff rather than what the need of the student is. Mm -hmm. So typically, professional development in most schools I've seen will, will lend itself to maybe seven days of, of extra work. And then the seven days, um, teachers are typically either filling up a report card. So it's not a meaningful dialogue. Nobody's talking about, uh, can the learning be uh, 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 more you know, valuable? Can, can, we, can we become better practitioners? So the first thing we did actually, in, in, again by design, was really flip that on its head. And we said, if, if we want high quality learning, we need to really shift the way we look at ourselves. So at Riverside, we shifted that whole thing to 50 days professional development. And that's a 50. 50 days of professional development that is by design. So it is through the week, it is over the weekends, it is before the children come to school, it is after they go back from school, I mean, uh, they leave for the holidays. So it's really, it's organized, it's put in the calendar. So it is not, it happened to be on a whim on one month, we happen to get two days, let's do professional development. It's really by design. And when you put that much of time in to become better in your practice, the result will start showing. The result will mm -hmm. start showing. And I think that became an important uh, design um, uh, detailing that happened. Again, in terms of the choices, every time you look at uh, the children and say, um, how does a concept like uh, evaluation happen? How do you kind of look at that? You keep going back to the children. You keep saying, what is it that you feel strongly about? How do you want to be looked at as a, as a human being? And very often uh, in most schools, again, we only look at our children through our marks. We say that's who they are, and a grade defines who they are, or a mark will define who you are. And here the whole premise is the whole child. I mean, like, how do you look at the child socially, emotionally, cognitively, spiritually, physically? And those become design detailing. So another interesting thing I keep saying, if you look at report cards of schools, and if it says math 45% or English 80%, no matter what the dialogue in the school can be in professional development, that is what you will value. Eventually, at the sum total of it all, the only thing that will drive the teacher is how many marks I have to give. 
So the dialogue will, will not become about the student, it will become about that particular mark. Again, you have to reverse that. So when you put together anything that determines uh, a child's identity, what will the school value? What will an education space value? It will start showing up in your artifacts that you design for the school, right from the planning, uh, right from the evaluation, right from the choices that you make. Your artifacts start showing uh, design. So even in the planning, if a teacher says, you know, my principal gave me this uh, thing and I have to go and uh, implement it, then you know there is no design happening there. So are you saying that you don't evaluate the children by marks in the no, first No, I'm year? saying so it becomes one of the many ways. It doesn't become the driving way. What is the evaluation process? Oh, here? it is, uh, it is ongoing. There is an evidence file that the child will bring to the space and say, I know I'm doing better. So typically, we uh, the evaluation so far has been, I'll tell you you're doing better, or I'll tell you you're not doing well. But there's no space for the child to come back and say, listen, I know I'm doing better. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm growing. So what, uh, the key component, one of the components of the evaluation is, you tell me you're doing better, get me a piece of evidence that shows me your growth, that you know you're doing better. Okay, so yeah. it's not just, I know you're doing better, but do you know? So the shift is, can we come to a partnership about how we learn? That is an important story that these students, the child has to say. So there's no surprises here. I keep saying, remove the surprises from education. Don't kind of suddenly throw to them to say, you know, this is how you're doing. Actually, as I told you before, we just came from Barefoot College and we attended the uh, uh, night school there. And what they have, and I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, is this youth parliament. Okay. Yeah. Have you heard about it? Yes. Basically saying that the children part of the management of the school. So they can kick out a teacher if they say... Not good enough? Not good enough. So are there any ideas like this here yeah, on yeah. side? Well, uh, it's, I would say, uh, a lot of what happens at Riverside is a collaborative. In fact, the children construct the situations with us. Um, they, they're in, they decide who we'll hire because they have to do, the t teacher has to do a demo class. Mm -hmm. And if the children feel that, that the teacher is good enough, then the teacher becomes part of the story. Otherwise, we, they don't. In terms of uh, kicking out a teacher, we've really not had uh, much space for that. We've really not had any occasions where we've had to do uh, that. But the feedback can actually help our decisions. So the feedback comes in by saying it's a regular case where the te teacher is just not performing. We've had two instances when that has happened where we've had to ask a teacher to look at another, another space that is better their fit rather than our fit. Because maybe there's a style or there's a personality that the teacher has that doesn't fit into the riverside um, sort of, you know, uh, mm -hmm. structure. Um, so it's really about, about right fits and wrong fits. You know, it's not really about firing somebody or throwing people out. So I think that they're definitely part of those. Uh, we, um, everything else, right from budgets of things that happen at the school or decisions regarding what sports they will take part in or decisions regarding where they want to um, and how they want to be, uh, to learn. All of that is a collaborative dialogue. So there's not really a parliament per se that is separate from the time that they do it. It really becomes part and parcel of their dialogue. Mm -hmm. It's an everyday dialogue. So not, it's not a formal um, parliament system, though I do, I, I am aware of uh, not only the Barefoot College, but in the Democrat schooling system, yeah. they have a lot of that. Yeah. So how would you describe, or what are the core values here at Riverside School? I think the, the, the single most defining core value is that children will do good and do well. So they have to understand that doing good is an important part of who they will become. So it is not just driven by the academic success of who they are. It is, can they become vibrant citizens of the democracy? I think okay. that's important. So they, are they informed? Are they concerned? Are they proactive? Are they responsible? Yeah. I mean, there is a pretty strong feeling of we yes. here inside Riverside School. What defines this we and why is it there? I mean, there is... I, yeah, it is very strong. Uh, I think also because, again, by design, we put a lot of time for the we to... to to simmer through the whole story. Uh, we, uh, so there is time for the school to come together. There is time for us to celebrate each other. There is time that is set aside for us to applaud. There is time set aside for us to critique. I mean, it's all of that. So, and this again, these are formal times that we put. 
so there will be a, uh, every month, I mean every week there will be occasions for that whole team to come together as a community. Every day, every group comes as a, as a community together, as a thing. So the concept of community is very strong. The concept of applauding another is very strong. And this also comes from how? It comes from me being comfortable about who I am. Only then I can say, hey, you're great. Otherwise, this tendency of being scarce in your mind, scarcity mentality I call, is terrible for any human being to have. Otherwise, you're always putting somebody down by thinking, if I put you down, then I become better. Yeah, this was actually, we were at yesterday, this session, me, we, yeah. with the kids, and I was really surprised uh, by, by the answers and the statements the kid gave. So the we is really yeah, pretty it's strong good. here. Yeah. And what we're showing is, and then what I keep saying at least, there are schools or different spaces should become beacons for what can be. And, uh, and in India, of course, there are some, several examples, powerful examples of how this is translating. And I think if Riverside can be that for, for space and education, I think that's a powerful uh, reason to do the work we are. What would you consider as other, other good examples for this? Of? Of this oh, of, 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 yeah. oh, I think, uh, I mean, I am familiar with a couple that uh, are strong examples. One is this, there's this friend of mine who started something called the Kaivalya Institute. Um, and they do uh, uh, principal training, principal training for principals. And they do a lot of work in Rajasthan. And I think they've started a lot of work even in, in Gujarat. Wonderful, wonderful work about how one can support a principal and uh, they have this, what's called the Gandhi Fellows. And for two years, uh, this fellow is groomed to be able to support a principal in these village schools and these government schools to translate and transform uh, the school practice. Of course, um, uh, the teach for all uh, pra um, concept is even in, in, in India as the teach for India model. That does extremely good work. Um, I have a friend of mine again who started something called I Discover I. They're doing some important work. Yeah, we met them in Delhi. You did, yeah. Yeah, and we are talking actually about them to, uh, they have this, how is it called? Exceed. Exceed. Yes. To develop a new thing for we school together yeah, yeah. with us. So they have, they have a, a strong model. Um, then this other friend who's, uh, Satya, who does something called the Indus, uh, the um, um, Indus World School, the IWS schools. So there are lots of good people coming and what is exciting in India is right now that good people coming into education. Another very, very dear friend of mine started a uh, wonderful system for evaluation. It's called Education Initiatives. Yeah, you know, so great people, great stuff happening now in India. Uh, and it's exciting, it's an exciting time. Of course, it will mean a lot more to be able to reach the numbers that we have. But for the first time, we have strong models. Mm. That's exciting. That's mm. exciting for India to have. Uh, Riverside School is a very protected oasis in the rough environment, so to speak. Uh, how do how do those kids apply what they're learning here? How is it being? Applied? How do you enter the school? No, no. So how do they apply what they kind of learn here? How do they apply to the outside world? Oh, well, uh, if you're asking, has anybody graduated and gone ahead? Not yet, because this is my first grade 12. No, no, no. I mean, the kids, you know, they come here and learn great oh, things. Yeah. But when they go outside, it's chaos and everything. So how is this being... Yeah. No, a lot of the work that, I mean, that's one of the models of Riverside that we've flipped again, is that being good in school is not good enough for me. That doesn't make any sense for me. I think for a lot of the kids, and if you've seen that, one of the strongest components of Riverside is our citizenship pro uh, programs. It means outside. That means in every grade, every child is part of an idea that is beyond self, that is in the community. So they have to go out, they have to meet with people, they, have, they will be rejected, they will have issues when somebody will say, no, I'm sorry, I don't want that. So they're learning that not everybody will be kind and gentle and happy, none of that. So a lot of the work they do is in life, outside school. Mm -hmm. So they have to spend a significant amount of time interacting and interfacing with life which is unlike, again, most schools. Most schools, 15 years, they spend in the school or mm. in a classroom, not even around in a community. And I find that they are less equipped to be able to deal with life. The Riverside children, I think, are far more because they're constantly going out, facing rejection, facing applause. So they go out into, let's say, slums yeah, yeah, the and... Oh, uh, yes, yes. Regularly. I mean, it's by every, every, every month mm. for 15 years, they do that. So it's a very important program.
how do you see the future of Riverside? I mean, what is the, let's say, right now is the, the ecologic movement or the green movement? Do you want to integrate that more into your curriculum or...? I don't think we need to force fit anything. I think if they can just, again, like I said, become informed, concerned, responsible and proactive, whether it's with the ecosystem, whether it was with poverty, whether it is with child abuse, whether it was their own, so it will come in. It doesn't have to be for a particular idea I will become this, this human being. Can I be this for generally the choices I make? Can my choices, my biggest thing for every child who leaves is, can your choice add value to another? That is for me non-negotiable at the side. Your life is meaningless if it's not adding value. So if your thinking, if your intellect, if your problem solving can actually fashion products that are of use to one or more, then it is a life well spent. So that is a very, very strong message that the kids will take out. It's not about, I become better. Mm. So whether it is with the eco, whether it is with technology, whether it is with uh, whatever it is for me, that is a very, very important message. I'm hoping that all my children, when they go out, I keep, that's why the experiences that they face during the 15 years, I keep telling them, I said, when you go out, and, and, and I'm wishing for you to do well in whatever you do, don't forget these faces, don't forget these stories. And you will be in a, in a position to make dramatic impact. And you know you can because those 15 years have been spent saying, I can, even when I was 11 years old, even when I was 13 years old, I could. So obviously when I'm say 26, 30, and I've got lots of money, I can make tremendous change. I think that's the story. Two more things. I mean, we have probably 100 more questions, but <laughs> people have to watch it. So very often yesterday I heard the word story. You just used it again. What is the the concept of a story, what is the idea behind a story here in Riverside School? Again, I think the story at Riverside is that I can add value. And I know it. And I have the tools to be able to do that. I am not helpless. You know, I can change as possible and I can drive it. Okay. And the very last question is, I mean, right here we have like 350 kids. Yes. How can we scale such a model? Yeah. It's a very elitish kind of thing. I mean, I don't mean it in a bad yeah, sure. way. It is. Um, I mean, it's costly, the school. It's uh, not a cheap school no, here. How can we scale a model like this? I mean, well, we're putting everything open source. So right now, Riverside's big project is putting it all up online uh, to have access to. So for instance, right now, we've already made our processes free. So for any school to take it, but the training we charge for because that's really where uh, uh, the intellectual property, this thing comes, the IPR. But we are currently, why do you think we document? We document all the time so that it will eventually be available for others. So currently we've got seven schools implementing the Riverside program. We work with government schools. We work with uh, um, government organizations to be able to take it. So we made all, all the material free. Mm. Anybody can take the material. What we're doing is we're charging for the trainings to be able to use that material. And then you take the material and apply applied for all the schools that you have. So our intention is that this cannot be, like you said, for 350 kids. It's a waste of all our time to be able to make it. So we're just currently working on this uh, platform, this, uh, this uh, web platform. It's, we're calling it the e-learning. E we want to make Riverside as if it's the best teacher training center. So have all the material up with the videos, with the planners, with the student evidence. So if you're starting a school, all you have to do is, if you, a teacher says, what can I do for this particular month? Just log on, download, mm -hmm. please use it. 